this is by far a complex case and I know many of you like cases with a resolution. But I see past this and know from dealing with families of missing persons how important it is to highlight their cases. In this particular case, nearly 29 years have elapsed with no answers. I was raised not far from Jojo. I walked the same streets of Callan like she did. I went to the same school as she did in St. Bridget's College in Callan. And as she was born in 1974, we were probably in school at the same time, but didn't know each other. I just want to include a little disclaimer also. I have done my best to have the information and timeline right, as there was many variations of Jojo's early years, so I went with what fitted best. But I may have some aspects of her early life wrong, and so I apologise for that. On Thursday, the 9th of November 1995, it was a cold winter's night here in Ireland, and not a night to be out on your own. But unfortunately, a young woman, Josephine Dollard, found herself in this predicament, and this is her story. Josephine Dollard, more widely known as Jojo, was born on the 25th of January 1974. She was the youngest of five children and was from a townland called Newtown Kells in County Kilkenny, around three kilometres from the village of Kells. She had had a hard life in one sense. Her dad died six months before she was born, and when she was nine years of age, she would lose her mother also. Her mother was a gifted dressmaker, painter and decorator, and worked for a local farmer to help make ends meet and to support her children. But Jojo was also blessed to have siblings to step in and take over the reins. There was Mary, Nora, Kathleen and Tom. When their mother died, it was just Kathleen and Jojo left in the home place. Kathleen was just 19 years of age and worked in a drapery shop in Callan. And when their mother died, she became legal guardian to Jojo. Jojo went to primary school in Callan and would go on to St. Bridget's College in Callan also where I attended myself. She was a few years behind me in school. Kathleen would eventually meet a man and marry him and Jojo would go to live with her other sister Mary in Cuffs Grange, halfway between Callan and Kilkenny City. Jojo was described as curious, affectionate, a little shy and a bit of a tomboy. But as she got older, she grew out of this and became very interested in her appearance and became very girly. Jojo was big into her music and loved Wham, Michael Jackson and Aha and always had her cassette player with her, earphones on, listening to her favourite music. She had a dog named Freeway, named after the dog in the TV series Heart to Heart. When Jojo left school, she decided to move to Dublin to become a beautician. She got herself a little flat with her best friend Mary Cullnan and they both worked part-time as waitresses for over two years. They both built up a circle of friends in Dublin and Jojo had a boyfriend there for a while. But both girls grew tired of Dublin and they wanted to move back to Callan. Jojo was finding it hard to juggle studying and holding down a job. She had also been left heartbroken by her boyfriend, an American man who had been staying in Dublin briefly. He was on a gap year and was travelling Europe and so when he left Ireland, Jojo felt lonely and so it was another reason to move home and be near family. So the two young women made the move and both had secured jobs in Callan Town working in a local cafe, Grangers. A new beginning for both. The jobs were to begin on Monday the 13th of November 1995. In the run up to moving back home permanently Jojo had to go to Dublin one last time to finalise things with her landlord and to collect her last dole, which is a social welfare payment you get when you only have a part-time job or no job at all. Jojo got the 8.30am bus from Callan to Dublin on the 9th of November 1995 and arrived there safely at Bus Aris, which is the main bus terminal for people travelling to and from Dublin from the rest of the country. She made her way to Rathmines by another bus and met with her landlord and then went on to the post office on Harl's Cross to collect her dole. As she got everything done early, 
She had time to kill and so decided to get another bus into the city centre to call to a pub that was local to her and her friends. The name of this pub was Bruxelles and it is situated on Harry Street, just off Grafton Street in Dublin. When she got to the pub, her friend was working behind the bar and so she decided to stay there for the afternoon, chatting to him and other friends that came in throughout the day. Some media outlets have implied that she went there with the intention of meeting up with one particular person, but these claims have been unfounded. At around 2.30pm, as Jojo is sitting at the bar chatting to her friend, an ex-boyfriend of hers walks into the pub. According to retired Garda detective Alan Bailey and based on witness accounts, Jojo and her ex-boyfriend rekindled their flame that afternoon. But this is not the same American boyfriend I mentioned earlier. After a few drinks, Jojo is happy and comfortable in his company. She decides to change her plans and spend the night in Dublin with her ex in a hotel. However, between the hours of 4pm and 7pm, things would go wrong for her. It was said that Jojo's ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend turns up at the pub and she is not well pleased to see the two sitting there at the bar, laughing and chatting together. A row ensues and the ex and his girlfriend leave together, leaving Jojo upset and alone once more. By now it is late and Jojo needs to get to Bus Iris to get her bus home to Callan, a 150 kilometre bus ride which would take at least two hours. So Jojo reverted to her original plan to go home to Callan and not stay in Dublin. By the time all this happened and when she finally got to Bus Iris Depot at around 9pm, she had missed her last bus and was now stranded in Dublin. To avoid this, Jojo decided to get the bus to Nace Town in County Kildare and thumb a lift to at least Carlow Town, if not to Callan. She had a friend who she could stay with there. This would leave her to only being 53 kilometres from home and she could easily get the bus the next morning and she'd be home safe. But with the series of unfortunate events already at play, things would only get worse and Jojo would never make it home. Jojo got the bus to Nace and the bus driver was adamant that he had had a brief conversation with her at the beginning of the bus journey and when she got off the bus in Nace. He recounted that she seemed tired as he had to wake her up because that was as far as the bus went before returning to Dublin. A motorist in Nace picked her up as she was thumbing a lift. He was an elderly gentleman and he would tell Gardy that he dropped her off in Kilcullen in County Kildare. He expressed that he had been concerned that a young woman was hitchhiking so late at night and he had told her he was sorry he couldn't bring her any further but that she should try and get somewhere to stay in Kilcullen and not continue hitchhiking. At around 11.15pm Jojo managed to get another lift to Moon in County Kildare. The young driver that picked her up expressed to her also that he could only bring her a short distance, 17 kilometres. He told of his concern that it was very late to be hitchhiking and still being so far from home. Jojo, at this stage, must have been so tired and frustrated. Each lift she was getting were only short lifts. By the time she got to Moon, she still had another 73 kilometres to home. By now, it was 11.35pm. It was dark, raining and cold. Through telephone records and witness statements, Jojo was seen in Moon and it was here she would phone her friend Mary Colnan at 11.37pm. She tells Mary about her day and what she was doing to get home, how tired she was and how she would be happy to get as far as Carlo and stay with her friend there and continue her journey home the next morning. While she is on the phone to Mary, Jojo has the door of the phone box ajar, with her arm out and thumb up, letting passing motorists know that she is looking for a lift. During the conversation with Mary, she interrupts it briefly while still holding the connected call. When Jojo gets back to the phone box, she tells Mary she has to go 
as she has just secured another lift. She promises Mary that she will ring her again once she reaches the next part of her journey. This call would never come. I may point out that this new lift is not going to bring her to her destination, but the next drop-off point, as Jojo had stated to Mary on the phone, and presumably it'll be a town or village that has a phone box, as mobile phones were not a thing back then. This is the last actual confirmed sighting of Jojo by someone that actually knew her. Many statements would come in after Jojo's disappearance that would send Gardi in all directions, from one end of the country to the other. I will go through these sightings as best I can. A witness stated that while she was driving through Moon at the time Jojo was believed to be there, she spotted a young woman matching Jojo's description, running from the phone box in the village to a dark coloured car. She said she was sure the woman got into the back seat of the car, which implied that there was already two people in the front. This car has never been found or the driver has never come forward. Another eyewitness recounts to Gardy that between 11.40pm and midnight on the night Jojo disappeared, they saw a young woman leaning into the back door of a dark-coloured Toyota Carina type car in Casa Dermot, which is the next town south of Moon, eight kilometres away and on the route to Callan. From this stage onwards, the sightings and timelines get more and more uncertain and witness accounts begin to contradict themselves. Therefore, Moon, County Kildare, remains the last known proof of life of Jojo. How far south did Jojo get? Did she get as far as Castle Dermot in the dark-coloured Toyota Carina? And was it the same car seen in Moon picking up Jojo or are the two vehicles unrelated? Numerous witnesses came forward to the Gardaí stating they had seen a woman matching Jojo's description walking the main street of Castle Dermot village close to midnight. One man said he spotted who he described as looking like Jojo as he entered a fast food outlet. But remember these people did not know Jojo personally. In autumn 1996, one year after Jojo went missing, a taxi driver from Waterford City, which is 100 kilometres from Moon in County Kildare, came forward with a story to the Gardaí. He said on the night Jojo was taken, he was just outside the village of Kilmacow in County Kilkenny, which is just a few miles outside Waterford City. He said he saw a car pulled in on the side of the road and a man urinating beside the car, when suddenly the back door of the car flew open and a young woman barefoot leapt out and started running onto the road. Another man also leapt out and ran after the woman, grabbing her and pulling her back into the car. The car then took off with all three. He believed the car to be a red Ford Sierra with UK registration plates which to me are not a world apart from the cars spotted in the Moon and Castle Dermot area on that night. The Gardaí deemed the sighting as unrelated to Jojo's disappearance, as the man said this incident happened around the same time Jojo was last seen 100 kilometres away in Moon. Another sighting was reported by a man in 2021. He said that he and his boss were driving through Moon and they saw a woman running through Moon Village, naked and screaming. Initially, it was deemed as credible, but the Garda Serious Crime Review Team would later rule it out. The man said he was very young at the time and in the truck with his boss. The boss, who was driving, pulled over to the side of the road, got out and began to run after her. But the more he went after her, the more she ran, which is understandable. The truck driver immediately phoned Gardaí and a unit was dispatched to investigate the incident. He was later informed that the incident was investigated in relation to the woman and was not related to the Jojo Dullard case. The truck driver also said this incident happened around 11pm, 30 minutes before Jojo ever got to Moon. A witness dubbed the 999 girl came forward and said she travelled in a car with Jojo as far as Carlow Town, before she got out at a set of traffic lights, 
with Jojo continuing her journey with two men. Two years later, that same woman came to Mary, Jojo's sister, saying she was the 999 girl. She apologised for lying, insisting she never saw Jojo and Gardy had told her to make the false claim. Mary said, quote, I just told her it was okay. What else was I going to say? She told me she wasn't well at the time and was frequently in the Garda station, so they knew her. Mary claimed that Gardy made this vulnerable woman pretend she was with Jojo to imply she was still alive when they travelled as far as Carlo to take the focus of the investigation out of the area of Moon, where Mary believes Jojo's body is buried. The 999 girl approached Mary at the unveiling of a monument in Jojo's memory at the site where the phone box once stood. A short time later, it was decided to remove that same phone box. As most of you that are familiar with the Vanishing Triangle, which I have mentioned in other cases, Larry Murphy is in the frame for Deirdre Jacobs' death, but Jojo's family insist he had nothing to do with Jojo vanishing. But by sheer coincidence, the suspect who Mary thinks took Jojo lived in the same vicinity as the notorious Murphy, aka the Beast of Balting Glass. Shortly after Jojo disappeared, a woman wrote a letter to the family home in Cuffs Grange in County Kilkenny. She said she was an ex-girlfriend of the suspected killer and that he had abused her during their relationship. The letter depicted a vile thug who was capable of murder and this is where the family again claimed that the killer is related to a politician whose influence has protected him. They have battled to have this man investigated and have his family's land searched. Mary handed over this letter that was signed, but no address was stated, unfortunately. The Gardaí have this letter in their possession and have never acted on its content. The family would love if this lady who wrote the letter to Mary would find the courage to reach out to the family once more and help in bringing Jojo home. When Jojo disappeared that November night in 1995, the next day her family, after not hearing from her, were extremely worried. They went to their local guard station and made a formal missing person report for Jojo. At first, the guardy dragged their feet in investigating the case and it would be a week or more before it reached national media status. By 1998, the family of Jojo became more frustrated with the investigation into the case. They are disturbed that private medical information they brought in confidence to the guardy about a termination Jojo had prior to her disappearance had been leaked to the media. They also insinuated that Jojo was some type of drug-taking tomboy that was fond of the drink, which was far from the truth. They felt that the Gardaí were using the media to blacken Jojo's name in order to avoid doing their job or to indeed protect someone. That someone that the family feel is being protected is the son of a well-known political family from the area in Kildare where Jojo disappeared. All these allegations by family members emanate from a meeting they say they had with a senior Garda officer in Angarda Síochána, which Gardaí would go on to deny that this conversation ever happened. No surprise there then. In the following years, the family hired their own private investigator out of pure frustration and losing trust in the Gardaí. They also took part in a UK TV series called Psychic Private Eyes. Jojo's sister Mary said, quote, They were strong about it and seemed to feel so definite about it that it really gave me some hope. The truth about Jojo is going to come out. Too many people know what happened for it not to. The psychic said they believed Jojo was murdered by a man who raped her and strangled her. They said Jojo managed to scratch her killer's face, leaving a scar. Tom, Jojo's brother, had died a few months before they took part in the TV series and the lead psychic told her that Tom was talking to her from the spirit world and at that time no one knew that Tom had passed away. This to me makes no sense 
as surely it would have been announced in newspapers and obituaries that Tom had passed. But I don't want to take away from Mary either and her beliefs. Mary hired the private investigator to investigate the man she believed killed her sister and the detective reported back that he had a raw scar on his face when he saw him. Mary did hire the detective between 1998 and 2017. I don't have the exact time, unfortunately, but it was at least three years after Jojo disappeared from what I could find. If the detective saw the family's main suspect, there is no way he saw a raw scar, especially if it was made by clawing with fingernails. Even if a knife was used, it would be healed somewhat after three years. It would be healed fully if it was just fingernails, in my opinion. This is me playing devil's advocate and no way do I want to take away from anyone's beliefs or add pain to Jojo's family. I'm just trying to dissect what makes sense, facts and truth. While this type of information can bring comfort to the family at the time, it doesn't lead to solid evidence in bringing Jojo home and give the family justice and it can often lead to distracting from the real evidence just like false witnesses can whether it's wanting to help or hinder the investigation. Sometimes well-meaning doesn't mean it's actually helping. It can actually hamper or even damage any future investigation and criminal cases. Mary spent 22 years of her life searching for her sister Jojo. She died in April 2018 at our home in Cuffs Grange in County Kilkenny after a short illness. She did not live to see closure or justice in the case of her missing sister. She was just 67 years old and had spent some time in St. Luke's Hospital and was moved to Castle Comer District Hospital before asking to be brought home to die. Up to the end, she wasn't talking about her death or illness. She was talking about Jojo. On the 19th of October 2020, following the Garda Serious Crime investigating team, Doing a cold case review, Gardie announced that the case of Jojo was upgraded to a murder investigation after reviewing several cases of missing women around this time, nearly 25 years after she went missing. Annie McCarrick's case was also upgraded to murder around this time also. A major part of their work was victimology and proof of life analysis. This process allowed them to reasonably determine Jojo is no longer alive and that she did not meet her death through suicide, said Detective Superintendent McTiernan. We can't just upgrade to murder on a gut feeling. We must have reasonable rationale that would show why we are categorising it as a murder, he said. The work that has gone into classifying it as that is substantial. Superintendent Walker said there was no silver bullet that moved the investigation forward. He instead cited the hard work of the SCRT, which is the Serious Crime Review Team. I think of another missing person, among others, as I write this quote from the superintendent. What about Imelda Keenan? With all the evidence that has been brought to the Gardaí in Waterford, surely based on their criteria of upgrading a case to murder, Imelda's case should stand with others as a priority. This family have been waiting for 30 years and it's not as if they haven't been pointed in a direction or given new evidence with new witnesses and still nothing has been done. It makes you wonder who is being protected here, the victim or the perpetrator. As with the Dullard family, they have said they know who murdered Jojo. Is it the case that the Keenan family know also? On the 25th anniversary, media continued to speculate that Jojo was part of the vanishing triangle of missing women, possibly the victim of a serial killer operating over many years since the very early 1990s. But no actual evidence is presented by media sources to substantiate these claims and headlines. I personally think that all these cases should be looked at individually and not under one umbrella. If it is going to take away from these women's investigations and finding the truth and finding them and bringing them home to their families. Many of these women that have gone missing 
have prime suspects and are totally unrelated to each other. Bar their age and the timeline they went missing and some would say area. I know Ireland is a small country and that is why they were able to triangulate any area of missing women for the time period. But men have gone missing also in this time frame and other women all over the country went missing or were murdered. If anything, this myth of the vanishing triangle by the media has done nothing but hinder solving these cases. This is my personal opinion. Like many cold cases, we must first put ourselves back to the time it was, 1995, and have understanding. We must not impose assumptions or views of life, behaviours and morals formed in hindsight. It was a time that is alien to us now, but it was the norm back in the early days. Mobile phones were not as readily available as they are today in Ireland. Hitchhiking was still a common thing to see on roads in and outside of major cities and rural areas. There was poor transport infrastructure and we had to improvise. Thus, we had to stand on the side of the road, stick out our thumb and hope for the best. Or we did it without a second thought, as we were not privy to the idea that anything bad would happen to us unlike today. In saying that, we did have certain cop on. The two men that gave Jojo a lift that fateful evening had expressed concern for a young woman hitchhiking a lift on a cold, dark winter night. I, for one, was not allowed to hitchhike, but that doesn't make you safe, because even the people you know can be predators. Naming no names, I lived 15 kilometres outside Kilkenny, and I was not driving at the time. I was a mere 17 year old and thought myself safe, getting a lift every morning from an older man who I knew all my life. He would pick me up in the village and we would travel to just outside the village to pick up a guy around the same age as me who also needed a lift to work. I would sit in the front seat until we got to his house and then I'd pop into the back seat and continue our journey. Until one morning I got in the car and there were porn magazines all over the floor of the car and in the pocket of the door. I didn't know where to look or what to say, so I said nothing. When we picked up the guy from outside the village, he was put in the same position as me. It was the longest car journey I ever had, but I was so glad the other guy was in the car with me. When it came to my stop, I got out and so did the other guy, even though it wasn't where he usually got out. He also didn't want to spend another second in this car with this older guy. That evening, when I got home, I told my father. He was livid and I was not allowed to go in the car with this man again, nor did I want to. Well, the next day, this older man turned up at our front door and asked why I didn't turn up for my lift. I can only guess what my dad said to him. This was my first introduction to life outside my family and how one can get into a situation through no fault of your own, and also how innocent we were back then, and saw the good in people, especially the people we knew. So I will tell this story to help you realise how we were all once young, and got ourselves into some precarious predicaments we might have thought better of later. We must not engage in victim blaming, and parade our sensible adult hats. It was truly a different time and we truly didn't think anything could happen to us. Jojo did her best, even on her late night journey home. I can understand her wanting to get there. She frequented places in Dublin where she was well known. She stuck to the most direct route without public transport and checked in with her friend Mary to let her know where she was and the predicament she was in. I can also imagine that this was not Jojo's first time to hitchhike from Dublin or anywhere else. It was so common back then. If she was safe then, then she would be safe again. Jojo was determined to get home that night and I can well understand her thinking. She did have options to stay in Dublin. She had loads of friends to stay with. But when home is calling you, then that's all you want to do. Go home. More than 2,000 people were interviewed. Some are relevant, some are clearly not. There are no credible witnesses that saw Jojo in Castle Dermot that night 
because they didn't know her personally, which makes their witness statements irrelevant. The true last known movement of Jojo was that phone box in Moon, which is no longer there. Many false statements have been made about the case of Jojo, which the Gardaí have had to investigate and would later turn out to be false statements. So please people, stop doing that. The Gardaí don't get a free pass either. To run to the family or media with unconfirmed tidbits of information, coming from out of active duty Gardaí, who have zero involvement in the current case. Stop that also. Both drivers that gave Jojo a lift that night came forward voluntarily and had been interviewed by the Gardaí and had been eliminated from their inquiries. This is a case of a cruel opportunist. Jojo was tired, frustrated and vulnerable. Jojo risked one too many times to get home that night. But the person or people involved in her murder has not and won't come forward. And so with so many years passed and with loyalty changing to certain individuals, maybe there's someone out there willing to give up the ghost and help bring Jojo home. If the person or persons that picked her up in Moon were as innocent as the two other people that had picked her up in Nace and Kilcullen, they too would have come forward. So I think Moon and that dark coloured car are the keys to solving this murder. To me, we can't not include Larry Murphy as a suspect. And in November 2023, Jojo's sister Kathleen urged Gardaí to search an underground chamber. An expert had linked to the beast of Bolton Glass. A forensic scientist believes he may have uncovered where some of Ireland's missing women are buried and he has passed on his findings to Gardaí, calling on them to excavate it. David Kenny has pinpointed a concealed underground chamber historically used for hiding just four kilometres from Murphy's home in County Wicklow. Murphy was convicted of the rape and attempted murder of a Carla woman he abducted in 2000 and his victim was rescued by two hunters just 800 metres from the burial chamber. Mr Kenny's investigations led him to the location of a souterrain detailed on a 1938 map drawn up by a local headmaster in Glencullen in County Wicklow. This historical document described a cave-like structure near a set of stones known locally as Fionn McCool's griddle stones. Mr Kenny retraced Murphy's movements after he abducted the Carla woman and drove her 40 kilometres to a remote woodland. All the dwellings in that area have been uninhabited since the 1950s and 60s and it is smack bang in the middle of the vanishing triangle and only a few thousand metres from Larry Murphy's home which is not far at all, said Mr Kenny. Kathleen, Jojo's sister, has urged Gardaí to search this area, especially since Jojo's case is now a murder inquiry and a lot more resources are now available to them to do the search. She also said, quote, Whoever's done this, they've hidden her so well that she hasn't been found. She could be anywhere. We cannot rule anything out. I hate saying serial killer because I can't. Until the day we find Jojo, I can't. Jojo didn't deserve this and she needs to be brought home.